chance, an 8% chance it blowing your direction and fall in your lot. You get some glory dust, you get some blessing. God's blessings are commanded. They are released in his capacity as a king. He orders his blessing. And what he commands cannot be vetoed. He saw that Balaam said that the Lord, I have received a revelation. That the Lord has commanded a blessing upon Israel. They fulfilled the right conditions at that time in their journey. And he said, when I perused in the spirit and I searched as a prophet, I found Israel to be in a place where they are under a commanded blessing. Somebody say hallelujah. No generational curse and no imposed curse of darkness through witchcraft, sorcery, or necromancy can prevail against the commanded blessing of the Lord. His blessing will not just counter, but it will conquer every cursing of the enemy. And no matter what system the enemy uses to project and to propel that curse against you, it will not be able to rival God's commanded blessing. So even a heathen man told me, what is for you is for you. And nobody could change that but you. I said, wow, if a heathen could get that revelation, much more us the church. Nothing that God has ordained and allocated, especially nothing he has commanded. He says, I have received a revelation that they are under the commandment of a blessing. And he says, I can only bless them because he has already blessed them. So he has already sanctioned or commissioned that blessing. He has already authorized that blessing. It has already been ratified in the courts of heaven. That order, he ends by saying conclusively, this blessing, the dynamic of it, it is a concluded blessing. He says, I cannot reverse it. I cannot revoke it. That means to cancel it. I cannot repeal it. That means to pull it back. And I cannot deflect it. I cannot reverse what the author of creation, what Elohim, the creative one, has spoken. For by the power of his spoken word, he has what? Fashioned the heavens and the earth. Not the power of his hands. The power of his spoken word. So when God pronounces a blessing, the dynamic of that blessing is not optional, it is mandatory. We are going to look today though and understand that the prophet did not stop at verse 20 in Numbers chapter 23, verse 20. We're going to look at verse 21. He did not stop by saying the blessing is working according to these dynamics, full stop. He goes on to say that the dynamics of divine blessings are accompanied with the conditions. With conditions or prerequisites of divine blessings. That's what we're going to be looking at today. The conditions of divine blessings. And we're only going to start in the first part. Verse 21. The irrevocable, that is the unaltered, unchanging, and undiluted, that means potent, Blessing of the Lord is powerful to counter and conquer every intended and every applied cursing of the enemy in Jesus' name. Even before the enemy actually releases the curse, when it is in the corridors of darkness being conspired, his intention can't even work. His applications of that curse cannot work in the mighty name of Jesus. Yet, frequently, God's people are devoid or empty of God's definitive blessings in their life. The absence of God's experiential blessings is not due to the failure of the dynamic of divine blessings. It is not due to the failure of the commandment of the blessing, the commission of the blessing, and the conclusion of the blessing. 
Rather, it is the lack of the prerequisite conditions of divine blessing. So once he has released it, it's out there. But it must be accessed, it must be experienced, it must be harnessed. It must materialize in your life. And that takes now prerequisite conditions. In other words, God's blessings are not only as a result of his grace. That is his power. The power that he releases. The favor that he releases by his word. But they are regarding, or rather, but they are conditional. Somebody say conditional. So they are released by grace, but they are conditional based on the condition of our obedience, etc. We're going to look at various conditions that will cause us to secure those blessings. Today we are going to peer into the council of truth regarding the sustained condition. Somebody say sustained condition. Say it one more time. Sustained condition. You see, sometimes we adopt the right posture for a while. So that we can get or derive the blessings that God has determined. But then we switch. Because we find God takes too long. Or we think that that position has not yielded any results. So I deviate from the path of righteousness. And from my faithfulness. And I don't sustain the condition that is necessary for God to crown me with his glory. We're going to look at the sustained conditions that must exist. Not may exist. It's mandatory. It's imperative. These conditions must exist for his supernatural blessings. There are situations in your life. There are constructs in your life that demand the supernatural. It does not demand the help of man. It does not demand your intelligence. It demands the supernatural intervention of God. It demands that God will miraculously intervene. That God will powerfully intercept. We must sustain the right conditions that there can be supernatural blessings and victory. A victory that must be secured. So Numbers chapter 23, verse 21 is our text. And he's speaking about Israel, that is Balaam, the prophet. And he's speaking to a king who is trying to establish a kingly rank and right against Israel. And he says, He, that is God, had not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither had he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. And the shout of a king. Is among them. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, he said. I have not beheld iniquity. In Jacob. Come on. That is the first truth. Revealed in verse 21. There was no iniquity. Somebody say iniquity. He said when I looked prophetically. When I looked with my discerning gift as a prophet. I examined Israel. And I found that God has not even found any secret sins. This is what iniquity means. Any wickedness. Any idolatry. Any trouble or sorrow that is associated with secret sin. Let's go that over. Iniquity, there are various words in the Bible that refer to sin. One of them is iniquity. Another English word is abomination. Another English word for sin is transgression. All of them refer to different categories of sin. It's all sin. But all of them refer to different manifestations of sin. And uh, he says, the condition that Israel fulfilled and they are sustained in, why they have received the dynamic of a blessing, the blessing of the Lord that cannot be vetoed, is that there is no subtle sin in Jacob. There is no latent hidden sin in Jacob. 
When we were in physics class, we learned of a type of heat that is called latent heat. Latent heat is heat that will change the state of water or a substance, but it will never be detected by the thermometer. So, the assignment was to put cubes of ice into a glass cylinder, like the Bunsen burner under it, put the thermometer within the ice, and observe what happens as the heat from the fire will convert the solid ice to liquid water. And for the entire process of heat being applied, we had to time it. It took minutes. The ice was converted into water. Heat was being implemented, but that heat was never detected on the thermometer. It was latent heat. There are some sins that are hidden in our lives. Even sometimes the most discerning of people will not discern it. The Bible says as it relates to prophecy, we know in part and we prophesy in part. So not everything God will reveal to a prophet or prophet is. God is not in the business of just exposing the dirty laundry, as they say. He loves us. It is only when it is necessary, he exposes us. He chastens us and he scourges us that we would be stripped of that sin and that we can bear fruit and that we will not lose our salvation. But there are subtle sins. And God said at this point in Israel's history, there was no subtle sin, there was no iniquity, there was no secret sin in Jacob's. He said further, there was no wickedness. Now that's a harsh, strong word to say of God's people. In 2 Chronicles, the Lord says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and do what? And turn from their wicked ways. He doesn't say if the heathen who are jumping up in carnival, the lost souls who are looking for happiness and love in all the wrong places, if they will turn from their wicked ways, then God will heal this land. We have too much sinners in the land. That's why God can't heal the land. That is not biblical theology. God says, my people, when I look at them, I must see that there is no wickedness. What is wicked is what is utterly evil. God is saying that there are times I look at you, my people, and I see that there is utter evil. I said this morning, and I've said it many times in preaching, the worst type of witchcraft to encounter and manipulation and sorcery is not from the Obia house. It is from the house of God. When brethren fight brethren on their knees, when brethren solicit other brethren to get some higher brethren to put down that other brother. Balak the king was trying to hire Balaam a prophet to use his prophetic rank and right to curse Israel. But what he said is, I could only bless them. I could only barack them. I could only get down on my knees and bless them. I could only praise them when I get down on my knees. He said, you want me to get down on my knees and curse them in my prayer closet? He said, but all I could do, because there is no subtle sin in them, they have secured a position where I cannot do them any wickedness. Sometimes I submit to you the wickedness prosper because there's wickedness in us to connect with the wickedness. Oh God. Let that sink in a little bit. For the lustful seduction to prosper, it must connect with the lust in me. That's what Paul said. He said, oh wretched man that I am, when I consider the war that is happening in my flesh. He says, not the war that is happening in the world, the devil will be the devil and evil spirits will be evil. But he says, when I consider that even though I'm an apostle, I have to bring this flesh under subjection, lest after I have preached the word, I become a castaway. He says, lest the wickedness be in me. And the wickedness that is in the world connects to the wickedness that is in the church. He said, but there's no wickedness. 
He says there is no idolatry. We think of idolatry mainly in the form of us bowing down to a literal graven image or doing some, all, some ritual at the altar of devils. But anything that we put before God, our business, our job, our children, our spouse, any person or anything we put in front of God and we begin to give them attention that we should be giving God is an idol. And the best of intentions at times could be rendered idolatrous because we can, by good intention, be attending to issues that need to be attended to and leaving God unattended to. Say amen if you believe that. Tell your neighbor, you're deep tonight today. You're deep tonight. You know why you're deep tonight? Because I'm preaching deep. I don't usually preach so philosophical. But I'm preaching deep because you are deep tonight. You are, you are ready for this. If you wasn't ready for this meat, God wouldn't have me share it. I would have shared milk. But he say you're ready for meat. Somebody say hallelujah. So idolatry can be in the camp without an idol image or statue. Because we can find ourselves. Let me if you are a deeper one now. We go into the Lord of that. Do you know your ministry can become an idol? You can spend more time in your ministry and developing yourself a ministry than you spend time worshiping God. The things that you want in your life, the good things, money, bills to be cleared, etc., cars, houses, whatever, those good things can become idols because you can find yourself in God's presence. All you're doing is asking for things and you're not taking time for Him. So when you should have been worshipping, now there's a time in your prayer closet where you petition him. He says you have not because you ask not. So you ask God for certain things. But your whole prayer can't just be asking. And two minutes of worshipping. Just like I said before, your whole prayer can't be sometime before in a service I said, it can't just be warfare, 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 binding, loosening, casting out, binding, loosening, casting out. There must be room for worship. You can weary yourself in the battle, binding, loosing, casting out, dealing with satanic thrones and dominions and altars of darkness and groves and images and all sorts of spiritual dynamics in warfare. You fight yourself into fatigue because you must balance it. War, worship. Petition, worship. Spend time worshiping your God. Hallelujah. Because there are things you will get in worship. Praying for things won't give you. Hallelujah. There are things he will give you in worship. That you was going to ask for. But he give you it. You didn't even have to ask for it. Because the worship brought you into a place of favor. It brought you into a place where he said. I must command something on you. I must come. You know what the word worship speaks of? It speaks of intimacy. So strong an intimacy, like the intimacy that happens between a man and a woman. It's nothing profane, but it speaks about our spirit. In the sex act, the spirit of the man and the spirit of the woman becomes entwined. Two becomes one. So the Bible says, now be careful, even if you go with a harlot, she's not your wife, but you become one with that harlot. Because Why? There is a union and an intimacy that brings a union between spirits. When you worship God, your spirit becomes one with his spirit. That is true worship though. When Jesus told the woman at the well, he said the hour has come and now is that the father desires such that we worship him in spirit and in truth. When we get to that level of worship, we are one with God. And when we're one with God, we don't need to tell him what we need. But he doesn't know. Hmm? Uh, you who are married and, and you know you, you know this. There's a thing you don't have to tell your spouse. Your spouse just pick it up. There's nothing hidden. The more close you get, is the more you know each other. And sometimes there is a language being communicated beyond words. God wants us to get to the place of intimacy. And if we don't get to the place of intimacy in worship, we'll get to the place of idolatry. So the devil will attack your worship life because he wants you to be idolatrous. 
He wants you to focus on the problems more than the problem solver. He wants you to focus on petitioning God more than worshiping God. He wants you to focus on the fight more than the victory. Sometimes just worship him for the victory. Just say, oh God, I thank you. I thank you that this is a real war. But there's a real victory. You're the God of victory. You're the God Jehovah Sabaoth. I worship you because you're Sabaoth. I worship you because you're the Lord of hosts. I worship you because you have already won the victory. And then you start to sing, Hallelujah. You have won the victory. And you speak in some worship tongues. Hallelujah. No warfare tongues. Worship tongues. Worship. Worship. And you come to the condition of a heart of worship. That is a place where iniquity cannot stand. That is a place where the light of his glory penetrates deep inside he says, I look and there is no trouble or sorrow associated with secret sin. No misfortune. Somebody say misfortune. So Balaam was saying, you want me to put a curse which is a trend of misfortune on Israel. He said, but when I look in the spirit, what the God of the heavens have shown me is that there is no misfortune because the trouble and the sorrow you want for Israel cannot be associated with them because there is no association with secret sin. If I must suffer and you must suffer, it must be for righteousness sake. The Bible said, happy are you when you suffer for righteousness sake. Woe be to us if we are suffering for unrighteousness sake. No subtle sin. That's the first condition that must be held to and sustained for the dynamic of the divine blessing to be encountered and to remain. If the devil can't stop the blessing from getting into your hands, the next thing he will do is try to snatch it away from you. Get it out of your hands. And sin is a door, an illegal premise for the devil to snatch away. So what he wants you to do is to get angry and sin. What he wants you to do is to lust and sin. What he wants you to do is to get prideful and sin. Because if he gets you in the arena of sin, you get into his domain where he can now steal. So they used to make a joke about it a long time. Where I was associated with a big church and they had a lot of cars to come on. And people used to get in road rage inside the church car park. Because somebody blocking them. And the person might really be wrong. They're inconsiderate. They, they car park full. So they park in front of them. And they inside probably having a good time. And the person in the car sit down saying, well, how long I have to wait? For? And they start to grind up. They start to... Rrr, 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 rrr. Yeah, inside the car. And all the blessing and the divine dynamic that they have received inside the church. Uh, they go in the car and the devil is standing right by the door and say, give me, give me, give me what you have. Give me, turn over, turn over, everything, everything, everything you have. You just keep getting back. Yeah, you, you see this stupid? You see, you see they didn't care about you? You see this church? And you start out here, yeah. And, 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 and you say nothing, but your spirit's beginning. So, he couldn't stop you from the atmosphere and what do you receive? But what he could do is come as a thief and thief your deposit. Siphon it out. Embezzle it. There are spirits of what is called, I call it embezzlement. You know what it is? You embezzle something, you're taking it in a subtle way. So if they take a one cent from your bank every, every uh, month, you will not notice it. You will not notice it. But it's still thiefing. Hmm? Some people take all their money out of the bank or they say that bank was thief. I say, how do you this? I say, well, that was a maintenance fee. No. Besides the maintenance fee, they were taking another fee. I say, you sure what I did? I went and I showed them. I showed the clerk. I showed it to the people. They t- taking more money. And they tell me they can't do nothing about it. So I do something about it. I say, what do you do? I take everything out. Under the mattress now. 
Because nobody wants to feel robbed or that their hard-earned substance or that their blessings is being embezzled even slowly and unnecessarily away from them. When the enemy is a thief, the different ways thieves operate. Some of them are bold and brute. Give me everything you have. That's not in your face. And there are others that are caught in. There are some spirits that are subtle. They'll come and take it from you and you even know they take it. Huh? Pickpocketers do that. They set up a scenario where you're talking to somebody, so they let one of them talk to you, so and then while you're talking, so and they smile, so they pass on the next time and see. My mother went to town one time, and she got a little change to spend and see the time, but you know when it's see the time, is robbery time. And she started walking through town, and I didn't know. They slip underneath my bag with a razor. And they take out everything. And she said, I didn't, you know, I didn't even feel the weight of the bag change. She said, because I had bags in my hand. They didn't try to come and rub her and jostle her and take the bags in her hand. You know, the man passed with a razor and was walking alongside her in the crowd. And just take her piss. She said, well, you didn't get nothing because I didn't spend any money. Thank God she didn't have no, no ID or nothing in there. She said, she said, I still come up. She said, all I've been study that, you know. Look, I bring KFC, I bring this, I bring my mother, my God. 500 was 5,000. Amen. I don't know how you women do that. You only take a little bit and only have multiplying power. Amen. That's the, the blessing of the woman. She is a multiplier. And all kind of things come back to this. But it still didn't feel good to me, and I'm sure in her heart it didn't feel good to her, to know that, listen, unawares to me, I was robbed. When you have iniquity, unawares to you, you're not associating the iniquity with your disqualification. You're not associating the iniquity with that which is taken away, the very substance of God's blessing that has been commanded over you. But it is. Secondly, he said, neither has he seen any what? Perverseness. And I'm going to stop here today. He has not seen any perverseness. The word perverseness means distortions, twistings, or satanic manipulation. He said, when I look in Israel, notice he didn't say when I look in the heathen camp. I am not seeing them distorting the truth. I am not seeing them twisting things. Perverting things, bending things for their gain against the kingdom of God. I'm not seeing them manipulating people. You have to be careful. You've got to be very, very careful and wise. Jesus said it this way. He said, be wise as serpents. You know why he says be wise as serpents? Because you're dealing with serpentine spirits. You're dealing with perverse spirits of Leviathan and Jezebel. So Leviathan is a satanic strongman of a dragon serpentine hybrid. So he has dual representation. Satan is referred to as a dragon. He's referred to as the old serpent. Leviathan, in his depiction of Job 41, he is bearing both dragon-like and serpent-like qualities. Jezebel is revealed as a satanic strongman against the prophetic, and she is what? She is one that seduces, and she is one that is a python. When the woman had the spirit of divination or fortune telling and she was a false prophetess, what she had, or the Bible says, was a python spirit, which is another type of serpent, constricting serpent. So he says, I have not seen the perversion of Leviathan, and I have not seen the perversion of Jezebel. I have not seen, there were no seductions of Jezebel, and there is no swiveling of Leviathan. Jezebel gains her power through seduction. That's how that spirit operates, mainly. She does it other ways. She seeks to annihilate. She seeks to murder. She seeks to attack. She seeks to bring depression. But she mainly operates within the realm of sexuality and carnality and seduction. Now, seduction is not only sexual. Seduction could mean they woo you in. They win your air. They win your favor. They win your attention. 
He says, but there is no Jezebel power in Israel at this time. There is no swiveling of Leviathan. Now, Leviathan, one of the ways he's referred to in the scripture is as a twisting serpent. So he will twist communication. He will twist your words. He will cause people to go away with the wrong meaning. And he knows how to build it up very convincingly in your mind. But he says, in Israel, there is no swiveling or perversion of Leviathan. Now, the Bible also says of Leviathan that he has many layers of flesh. That means he has many layers of carnality. So both Leviathan and Jezebel, they are a satanic duo. They work together. These satanic strongmen work together. You see it represented in scripture as Baal and Ashtoreth. Baal was the male deity that they worshipped. Ashtoreth was his wife that they worshipped. They worship went together. You see it as Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab was the man, the king, who was married to Jezebel, who was a seductive queen. The warrior queen. And they are very strong satanic powers, but they don't have to be stronger than the saints. And how do we know that? Because God says, when I look at Israel, there is none of that in Israel right now. Hallelujah. The perversions, the seductions, and we see it intensified at certain times. So right now it's carnival. So what happens? There is a spirit, and they, they're bold about it. They're telling you in Israel, you're feeling that vibes in the air. Right, you they keep telling him to your food. You're feeling that energy in the air? Well, add to the energy and take their plan or whatever. They try, they, they're trying to use the spirit of the time to convince you for money. I mean, they're just a business. They'll use any time. When it's Easter, they might say something about Christ and that. You know, they're just in it to make the money. But they have identified that there is what? An energy. There is a demonic power. So lustful men like carnival because they say at carnival women that will never dress in certain things dress in it. And women that will not even look in their direction will dance to them. And you ask those said women after carnival that period of time and Jezebel retreats a bit they get back to normal. They are dignified. They are well clothed. And they are not behaving like Bacchanal. But around carnival, there is something that happens. There is a release of a seduction of Jezebel. And there is a release of even a carnality of Leviathan to bring about death. Let me tell you how Leviathan works. He works, one of the ways he works is through STDs. Sexually transmitted diseases. So there are those who engage in sexual acts in carnival. And months later, they manifest sexual diseases. Some of them manifest AIDS, HIV, and they die. The destructive power of Leviathan works through STDs. So they are exerting an influence right now. And that's why the church, the church needs to maintain a condition of purity. The church needs to maintain a condition where there is no subtle sin, there is no iniquity, but there is also no perversion. No perversion in the pulpit. No perversion in the congregation. No flirtation. You know, flirting could go on very long before actual sin. But don't court the devil. Flirting is courting. You're courting Jezebel. You have not laid with her yet, but you're courting Jezebel when you're flirting with her. Hmm? If you recognize that someone is coming around you, with a lustful intent, and you just know. And you realize they're complimenting you, but it's not just they're saying this shirt looks nice and new. They're saying it with an intent. I remember before I met Sister Rodney, I was single, and you know, I mean, that time I don't think I was that nice anyway. But there was this young lady, and she said to me one time, Hey boy, I really like your shirt. It was not a new shirt, it was a worn out shirt. And I said, Okay. And at first I thought it was just, she liked my shirt. So another time I'm talking to her, and I'm talking, and we're not talking about shirt or clothes or nothing. And she turned her watching me, so, 
And I see her mind drift. Eh? I don't know what she was thinking. But then what came out of her mouth was just like, I like your shirt, you know. And I was like, it's a normal jersey. <laughs> and right there, the Lord told me, he says, you know what is coming with those words? You think it's harmless. She is setting her heart on the fire. So I started to move a little more serious with her. And even though we were liming in groups, you know why you're liming in groups, young people? Sometimes, even though you're liming in groups, you just pick who you're talking to in group. So I started to realize now, I must not pick to talk with her too much. Because we're friends, I don't want to ruin the friendship. And I'm not giving no place to youthful lust with the young lady. Somebody say hallelujah. If you want to be blessed, and you want powerful blessings, you cannot be attached to provision. You cannot be attached to Jezebel's seduction. You cannot be attached to swiveling things and, and, and perverting things and, and being deceptive. And you cannot be attached to Leviathan's pride. You cannot be proud. Because pride comes before fall. Grace comes before blessing. Pride comes before before. So if, hear this, if you get a blessing... The devil said, ah, I wasn't able to block it. You encountered, you experienced it. The next thing he says, let me see if I can get you proud so I can throw you down. And I can take that blessing from you. And I can make that blessing of none effect. So these are two conditions that you must say to yourself. No subtle sin. No secret sin. No wickedness. No idolatry. No iniquity. And no Perversion. Remember this, young man. Lust only comes strong at a time. It has a time to tempt you, my friend. So you just check your clock. The temptation will go. But you say, Pastor, I couldn't help myself. You could. You could. You could stand up as a man and say, No. Just looking back at you. You're nice, but you're not nice enough to make this sin. And no matter how much urge you feel with your hormones and your emotions and your youthful virility, you can still say no. Do you know that long time you had young ladies? That weren't even Christians, but because of their level of morality and their training from their mothers and grandmothers, they said, I am never having sex before marriage. And they, they held to that vow. You could have, you might get a kiss, but you're not, I'm not going in a bed with you, boy. That is only for my husband. And they weren't even Christians, but they made up their mind. No means no. You have the power of Christ inside of you. You have biblical knowledge inside of you. Some young people don't know fornication is a sin. They think fornication is okay. But you grew up in church. You know, the young people know. That is a sin. That is opening the door to Jezebel's spirit. That is created on God this whole time. So, even though the temptation comes like an arm rubber, take me now. And you say, oh Lord, how I end up here with this young lady alone. How I end up in this situation, in this kind of chat. But then you say to yourself, you have the consciousness to say, God will make a way of escape. The lust has a time. And if you stand your ground, it's gone. Strongest lust has to go. Why? Because God is fair. He will always make a way of what? It takes a few minutes for lust to catch you, and it takes a few minutes for lust to over. And then it takes hours and minutes to be in regret. Every addiction works like that. Drug addiction is the same thing. It comes strong. You say, I can't move up, I can't move up. I feel like I need to do this thing. I need, I need, I need. 
and they started speaking and they started saying, in the name of Jesus, I stand my ground, I'll be pure, I'll be pure, I'll be pure, I'll be pure, I'll be pure. I just need to wait this out, I'll be pure. And then all of a sudden, it's gone. Just as it came in a hurry, it leave in a hurry. That's how you know it's a spirit. And he started to say, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. Oh God, I could have fallen, but I didn't. Hallelujah. I stand the ground. I stand as a man of God. Hallelujah. No Jezebel was able to take me down. No Leviathan was able to destroy. Because God has commanded a blessing on me. And I must get that blessing and keep that blessing. And no devil. And it means we get ready to pray. Somebody say conditions. Determine. Your sustained conditions determine your supernatural blessings. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. 